I wanted to introduce myself and also introduce our amazing partners. Um, this was a group effort. Um, those of us, those entities here in High Point that have a, a major stake in the success of the furniture industry, uh, we thought it would be well worth it to come together and have this very important conversation. So I'll start by introducing myself. I am the uh, project uh, leader for this event, but not without these amazing partners. My name is Joyce Rice. I'm a business services consultant with Guilford Works. Hey, good morning. I'm Brian Norris. I'm the VP of Strategic Conditions here at Business High Point. We help uh, drive common yards here, so welcome if you're first time uh, here. We're thrilled to have you. This is a $50 million project that's helping catalyze High Point and uh, all in, in many ways around furniture and design and helping to drive High Point forward. So glad to have you here. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. And good morning. I'm Sarah Stevenson. I work at the City of High Point within our Economic Development Department. We work to recruit, retain, and revitalize our community. So you guys, with your businesses already here, we would love to have a conversation with you if you ever have expansion or relocation needs. Uh, we would certainly welcome that conversation. And this is my colleague, and I'll let him introduce himself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Montana Brown. I'm the newest project manager for High Points EDC team. Like Sarah said, we were to recruit, revitalize, retain businesses. Um, we'd love to entertain discussions with you all. Uh, if you'd like a car, please, please uh, feel we free to ask. Yeah, we brought a lot, so I was uh, running out. And thank you guys for coming here today. Good morning, Steve Castillo with GTCC. I'm the Director of Business and Industry Training, and we are responsible for the Furniture Academy, which is the workforce training uh, that uh, is uh, front and center with this conversation today. And as you may know, Guilford Works, we work uh, as a convening role in Guilford County. Um, we try to really cultivate healthy labor pipelines for specific heat industries, uh, which are uh, manufacturing and offshoot of that is furniture, healthcare, aviation, um, logistics, and construction. And so we are uh, elated to uh, bring you all together today. And so now we will proceed with the rest of our agenda. And we have. Um, Neil Aaron Harrington in the room. We're so excited to have him. He is going to speak on Labor and Economic Analysis Division. Um, and he's going to talk about trends and insights in Greensboro and High Point. Can you please welcome Neil Harrington? Good Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Harrington. Thank you for all for having me um, with the Labor and Economic Analysis Division. We have our limitations of technology wise, so we're getting ourselves all set better than the last one. Yes, we're all set. Good morning, I'm Neil Harrington. Uh, I'm with the Waiver and Economic Analysis Division at the uh, North Carolina Department of Commerce. Uh, thank you all again for having me here today. I'm excited to uh, be here talk about uh, the furniture manufacturing industry in Greensboro at High Point uh, uh, and tell you what the data says about trends in the industry and what kind of insights we can glean uh, from the data. Uh, so before we uh, dive into it, just kind of uh, wanted to give an outline that's going to guide us for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, so first I'll kind of talk about uh, what data says about how the industry is doing in terms of employment uh, and move on to talk about some of the hiring challenges facing furniture manufacturing. Um, and talk about uh, some uh, ways to meet hiring challenges, uh, and then finally wrapping up with uh, kind of some insights on uh, the, the, the future of the furniture industry uh, in Greensboro High Point, which is largely a good for the state as well. Uh, so first, how's the industry doing? Um, right, well, uh, manufacturing in uh, Gilbert County, which is the larger manufacturing sector, so including furniture manufacturing, every, every other type of manufacturer, um, it's, a top, it's a top industry by total employment in the area. Um, in uh, the first quarter of 2022, manufacturing employed about 32,000 people in Gilbert County, um, which was the second highest or second largest industry by total employment, second to only uh, healthcare social service. Um, so diving into the uh, different types of manufacturers in the area, uh, furniture and related products manufacturing tops the list of, uh, of of manufacturing subsectors in Guilford County uh, by total employment, right, in the first quarter of 
2022, there's about 32 to 3,300 uh, people employed in furniture manufacturing in the area. Um, and so what happened during COVID, right? That's on everybody's minds. How is uh, total employment in the industry in general um, covering from COVID? Uh, furniture manufacturing, it has recovered from COVID uh, pretty strongly for the most part, but it still is a little bit behind uh, total uh, jobs recovery in the area. Uh, right, furniture manufacturing took a much larger hit in terms of employment um, than, uh, than all jobs in, in Gilbert, the Greensboro High Point uh, metro area did. Um, it bounced back pretty, pretty fast and pretty strong uh, once the economy kind of opened back up. It's gradually uh, been coming back and gradually been recovering since then. But there's still there's a little bit of ground to cover um, uh, to get back to the pre-COVID levels. Uh, it's still employment furniture is still about four and a half percent below what it was in February 2020. In February 2020, while uh, all jobs in Guilford County uh, are about one percent above uh, what it was at February 2020. Um, and compared to the statewide furniture industry, uh, Greensboro High Point's uh, metro area's furniture industry is also a little bit uh, is lacking the recovery uh, of the statewide furniture industry. Right, the statewide furniture industry is a little bit closer to February 2020 levels, but it's still uh, about 2% below uh, what it was back uh, about two, two and a half years ago now. So that brings us to key takeaway number one, uh, furniture manufacturing employment is really important to Gopher County, um, but it's still recovering from COVID losses right now. Uh, and you know, we'll probably catch back up sooner than later, but it's still a couple of rapid uh, coverage. So number two, what, um, what are the kind of the hiring challenges in the industry facing? And what does the data tell us about uh, hiring challenges? And, in furniture, um, well, uh, you know, right off the bat, it's a very tight labor market. Um, a lot of employers in the room, I'm sure it's not news to you. Um, how many of you have had trouble hiring or filling up positions in the past two years or so? Probably pretty much everybody that's an employer has, right? The, uh, and it's not just furniture, it's across every industry, across the entire economy. Uh, so job seekers per job opening, which is a common measure of uh, labor market tightness, um, it's been at some of the lowest levels on record um, in recently, really the past two years, and really before COVID, too, um, it was at kind of historic lows. Statewide, um, North Carolina had about one job available per every interested worker in the most recent data, September 2022, um, and conditions are even tighter in uh, the Greensboro High Point MSA, with that, that blank pink line there, and they're even tighter um, in, uh, in Guilford County, where there's about two jobs available per interested worker in September 22 in Guilford County. Um, we expect that that kind of this type of labor market conditions to remain. Yeah. What is the price point on that two jobs to every one two jobs to every one person? The price point. And like, what's the what is what is the wage they're being offered? I mean, are there uh, that, other? Yeah, that, that will vary drastically. So this is just looking at the ratio of I, uh, opening the yeah positions, opening positions to actual people that are employed before talking. I, I was just wondering maybe there was a different motivating factor. Yeah, 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 there's a lot of factors, right? Price being one of them. Uh, but, you know, these actual the openings, there's no, this is, there's no kind of price considerations for this actual uh, But looking at uh, just manufacturing alone, uh, right, labor markets in manufacturing, so the larger manufacturing sector, uh, are still remarkably tight. Um, in the Piedmont Triad Prosperity Zone area, which is about a 10 county area of the Triad. Uh, there's about 1.3 job openings uh, per job per job seekers per job opening um, on average between 2018 and 2020. The state is a little bit older, the way it's calculated hasn't been updated in a while. But uh, so the, the, this this actual uh, uh, job seekers per job opening measure might be lower now than what it was pre-COVID. Uh, but compared to other metro other uh, prosperity zones, large metro areas, like the North Central Prosperity Zone, which has Durham, Chapel Hill, Raleigh, and uh, the Southwest Prosperity Zone, which is Charlotte, it's pretty comparable. The manufacturing center zone market is about as tight as those in manufacturing. And the triad is a little bit tighter than what uh, North Carolina's larger manufacturing center uh, labor market is, is seeing. Um, and so kind of drilling into the different occupational types, group pathways in manufacturing, uh, labor markets are pretty tight across all occupational groups within the sector. Um, so production, uh, it looks a little like it's not as tight as some of these other ones, but um, production occupations are still seeing about 1.6 job seekers per job opening. Um, and for some kind of historical context, right, 10 years ago, uh, across all industries in the Piedmont Triad, there was uh, about 4.2 job seekers per job opening. 
Uh, so even though production occupations are a little bit, uh, a little bit, there's a little more slack in those labor markets than maybe manufacturing, production, process development, or maintenance, installation, or repair, quality insurance occupations, it's still a really tight job market for production occupations in every occupation group and manufacturing. But there is a larger uh, kind of labor supply demand imbalance in manufacturing occupations that require higher education. Uh, right in the manufacturing, production, process, and development occupations, there's about two uh, jobs available for a trusted worker uh, on average between 2018 and 2020. Uh, so really this is just emphasizing the fact that uh, there's, uh, there might be uh, more of a skills mismatch between uh, what manufacturing employers need and what, uh, what the labor force can provide in these occupations that require higher education and more skills, right? Um, and it emphasizes kind of the need to uh, be cognizant of that because that is likely to remain in some form as uh, technology progresses and, uh, and technology can be implemented in manufacturing process that makes the production process more efficient, which I'll expand on in a little bit, but the uh, point is right that there's, uh, there's kind of a growing need here for uh, more skilled workers in manufacturing. Which brings us to uh, key takeaway number two, it's hard to find workers, uh, right? There's a labor shortage, uh, I don't think that's that's a surprise to anybody, but um, it's uh, kind of a challenge in the environment that we're in. Um, and number three, so how can we meet hiring challenges? Um, the hiring challenges for hard by workers and others. Uh, so first off, right, manufacturing employers uh, cite low pay as a top reason for hiring difficulties. So LEAD runs an employer needs survey every year that asks uh, a variety of questions. One is reasons for hiring difficulties and among manufacturing employers. Low pay was one of the um, top concerns that they had, or top, you know, Factors of, uh, of uh, trying to trying to hire people uh, for both entry level and above entry level positions. About forty percent of manufacturing employers said that low pay was a uh, was a factor there. Um, so higher wages can attract workers and meet demand. When I was driving in from Durham this morning, right there was a uh, billboard. Procter and Gamble was advertising they're trying to hire right twenty dollars twenty one dollars an hour was the biggest thing on the billboard. Right, people are really trying to increase wages to attract workers. Uh, so the elephant in the room might be. How furniture manufacturing's wages stack up against other manufacturers, right? Um, well, they uh, furniture and related products manufacturing pays kind of a lower average weekly wage than what some other uh, manufacturers pay, right? In the first quarter of 2022, um, the average weekly wage in furniture and product related product manufacturing is about $852, uh, which uh, was about $100, $150 less than the uh, the average weekly wage across all three-digit manufacturing subsectors in uh, in Guilford County. Uh, and it's about four hundred dollars lower than uh, what the average wage was across all industries in the area. Right, this is twenty. This is twenty twenty two quarter one. So mm -hmm. this is eight months ago. Wages are probably higher at this point now, and um, a lot of folks have probably increased wages to try to attract more workers. But uh, this is where it was at about uh, uh, about six eight months ago. So higher wages can attract workers and meet demand, right? What else can uh, can we do? Well, manufacturing firms um, identified an employer needs survey that um, lack of skills, education, and experience was a big another big reason for hiring difficulties, especially for above entry level positions. Um, about half of manufacturing firms who responded to this survey identified that um, that as a top concern for hiring difficulties, um, while a lower share of um, of uh, employers in all industries said that this was a big factor. Uh, but employers in all uh, in other industries or across all industries, they increase training in response to this at higher rates than manufacturing firms did. Uh, so stronger investments in skills development, education, and experience is maybe another way to uh, combat higher difficulties in the industry. Um, and so things like investing in apprenticeships, on the job training, you guys probably know more about the actual avenues to train people than I do in furniture manufacturing, but um, the, the data is indicating that there might be one way to uh, to kind of help meet these difficulties. So um, a third way to help meet, uh, help meet demand in uh, furniture manufacturing is to hire non-traditional workers, right? So people like justice involved individuals, people with disabilities, youth to an extent, there's probably limitations to I mean, what age people you can hire in uh, manufacturing outfits, I imagine. Uh, women, people of color, other, other, other underrepresented groups that aren't uh, kind of the traditional uh, avenues of, of, uh, of labor that you, that you would go to. Um, right, so a few examples of that uh, are uh, young people, right? Young people can be a, um, a really good uh, source of, uh, of uh, labor for furniture manufacturing. And this is really 
Um, non traditional sources of labor is really a good uh, uh, demographic data in the workforce is a good way to identify where those underrepresented groups are. Um, we see that young people are um, a small share of uh, furniture manufacturing and employment rates for a high point. Um, and the workforce is aging, right? So that's kind of complicating. Uh, yeah. So the question about um, is, does this show manufacturing across all things? Uh, one of the things that um, is being lost is artisan work. Right, you know, very, very tender, delicate artisan work. So does this include? Yes, yeah, so this, this is just all, um, all employment furniture. So it, it would include artisan, but it's not necessarily. Uh, Which is a place that's difficult to direct their work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you can't really be an artisan if you're 18. You have to cut an apprentice first, I imagine, right? You got to work your way up. Uh, but right, the fact that there's a uh, the, the share of prime age working adults, 25, 54, is declined by 13 percentage points while the share of older workers, who probably are those artisans, is mm -hmm. more than double, right? That kind of stresses the need to get younger workers involved in the industry so you can't train them up to be artisans uh, down the road. Um, so young people could be a source of non-traditional uh, uh, labor to turn to. Uh, another uh, source is female workers, right? There's a lower share of uh, furniture manufacturing labor force that is female compared to all industries in Greensboro High Point. Um, just about 38% of the uh, furniture manufacturing labor force in Greensboro High Point is female compared to about half of the uh, entire labor force in the metro area. Um, but furniture manufacturing does do uh, a, a better job than uh, the larger manufacturing sector at employing, um, employing women. Um, the larger manufacturing sector in Greensboro High Point is about 33% female. Right, and uh, this might be widely explained by uh, lots of occupations like upholsterers, sewing machine operators, things that were traditionally uh, uh, worked by women, right? They're traditionally, traditionally appeal to women that uh, other manufacturing outfits like wood product manufacturing might not be able to appeal in the same way. So that could explain this difference in some ways, but it can also maybe provide a competitive advantage to um, in attracting uh, women into furniture manufacturing over other manufacturing outfits. And lastly, uh, some racial groups can be a source of non-traditional labor, <laughs> uh, right? So white workers are the predominant uh, racial group in, uh, in furniture manufacturing. About 56% of uh, furniture manufacturing's uh, labor force is white, but that's a much lower share than the total uh, total private employment labor force in Greensboro and the total labor force in North Carolina. Um, and this is, you know, largely driven by the fact that there is uh, a much higher share of Hispanic and Latino workers in uh, manufacturing compared to uh, the larger metro areas like the force and the, the statewide labor force. Uh, but, you know, there's, uh, there's kind of an underrepresentation of black workers in furniture manufacturing, just about 16% of uh, main, furniture manufacturing's uh, labor force is black, and it's a lower share than the uh, total private employment in Greensboro uh, metro area and the total private employment in the state. So that could be kind of an area <laughs> of untapped uh, labor that, that furniture manufacturers can turn to to, uh, to recruit. Which brings us to our uh, third key takeaway, right? Higher wages, skills training, and investments, not just the workers. All of these can help uh, solve hiring difficulties. They're not, by any means, the only uh, way to solve, solve hiring difficulties. Just some options to consider and kind of get um, your brain working and thinking of kind of other ways to, uh, to accomplish this, right? And then finally, number four, where's the industry headed? What's uh, the future of furniture manufacturing in Greensboro and in the state? Um, well, you know, it's probably no surprise to you all to, when I say that furniture manufacturing employment has been cut by half in the past 30 years. Um, like globalization, automation, technological progress, all of that has contributed to that. There's just kind of a lower demand for workers in furniture manufacturing, among a lot of other factors. Uh, but we would kind of expect those trends to continue in a lot of ways, right? Um, employment in Greensboro's furniture manufacturing sector will probably continue to gradual decline. Um, we does uh, employment projections at the industry and occupational level, um, and they show that furniture manufacturing in Greensboro, the Greensboro sub prosperity zone, and the Winston Salem sub prosperity zone in North Carolina are all expected to decrease by about 0.2 percent uh, per year over the next uh, several years, which is a little better. It's a little better than the larger manufacturing sector. The larger manufacturing sector is supposed to decrease. Employment is supposed to decrease by about half a percentage point per year <laughs> through 2028. Um, but uh, you know, this is a larger driven by automation, right? I've done some work recently trying to gauge different industries' uh, susceptibility to automation-related employment disruptions. Um, and furniture, really, a lot of manufacturing ranks about, I think, the expo automation exposure category is seven out of 10, so one being the least exposed, 10 being the most exposed to automation. 
Um, and so you know, it's a little more exposed to automation and related disruptions than other industries. And this is largely driven by uh, kind of the occupational mix within, uh, within uh, furniture manufacturing. Excuse me, I'll grab some water. Um, so the occupational mix, uh, right, the furniture manufacturing has a lot of occupations that uh, are, uh, have tasks that are routine and manual in nature. So they theoretically could be accomplished by machines should the technology be develop, developed and make sense to implement. Um, so uh, we, we would kind of expect this, these two trends to uh, suggest that employment will continue to decrease over the long run. That's not to say that furniture manufacturing industry is going away, right? Um, we've looked at GDP uh, data um, around the uh, furniture manufacturing industry and the output from the industry hasn't really decreased at all over the past 30 years as, uh, as technology has progressed. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and production processes become more efficient, right? It's just saying that the nature of work is likely to change in the industry. And there's likely to be a lower demand for labor moving forward um, in terms of the actual uh, types of occupations that are needed. There's probably going to be a shift away from uh, physical routine um, tasks more towards uh, uh, labor that is more skilled and higher educated in nature. Um, and right, we're seeing that uh, kind of play out in the uh, employer needs survey. Uh, future demand, there's more demand for skilled and education labor now, right? So that's probably going to continue in the future. So it's really important to, uh, it's really important to uh, keep that in mind and to invest now in the, uh, in the skills development of the future workforce, right? And we've really seen, seen this kind of trend play out over the last 30 years or so, right? Or 20 years or so. Uh, there's been a larger, uh, uh, there's been a noticeable increase in the share of furniture's uh, uh, labor force that has higher education with a bachelor's degree or some college, and there's been a decrease in uh, lower educated workers, right? So we, we really expect this trend to continue as technology advances, and it's important to start thinking about it now and training folks, getting them into apprenticeships, on the job training, community college programs, things like that. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> And to uh, and also think about the different types of workers that might be needed for furniture manufacturing in the future, and building connections to those institutions that train them. Uh, all that is really important, right? And so it brings us to our fourth key takeaway: the long-term furniture manufacturing will continue changing and increase demand for skilled and educated labor. So that's our four key takeaways. Um, I hope this was helpful to you all. I'm happy to try to answer questions if I if I can. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for having me.